Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, uh, Tuesday night edition. Tonight's topic is bringing the love back to the visual field. And our speaker is Dr. Greg Caldwell. He's a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. We also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute in Philly. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease co uh, consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment disease, and he has been a participant in multiple FDA clinical trials, uh, including, I think, the, uh, the ocular hypertension treatment study. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care. Thus, he really practices integrative optometry. He is co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. He's lectured extensively throughout the U.S. and over 13 countries internationally. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Optometric Association and has served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016. And he's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, a nice virtual round of applause for my friend and partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell. Greg, take it away. Thanks, Joe, and I appreciate that introduction. And just going to jump right in here and it is with this visual field lecture and um, real quick with disclosures, the content that was prepared independently by me. You can see the laundry list of people that I've lectured for and advisory boards. And again, you've heard me say this before. I really don't do that to really show off and try and be impressive. It's just to try and if we're going to be delivering education to our colleagues at a high level, it's just kind of nice to know what's going on out there, staying in touch and be able to deliver uh, to you at, a, at what we hope you feel is a high level. Um, I don't have any uh, financial or direct proprietary interest in really anything I'm talking about here tonight. Um, and I have a non-salaried financial affiliation with the Pharmanex. Uh, with Involve, I sit as the PA Medical Director, Health Registries. Now it's AMD and Diabetes. I share sit as the Chairman of the, the Advisory Council. Um, this is the, really the most important, you know, the content and format of this course is presented without commercial bias and doesn't claim any superiority over any commercial products or services. You know, there's sometimes we're going to mention things, Joe and I will mention things that, uh, um, you know, about a certain instrument might be proprietary. I'm not saying it's any better or worse or superiority or have any financial interest. It's just the fact of the fact. So sometimes we do have to bring in companies' names when we're doing these education, as Joe mentioned, half owner and uh, optometric education consultants. And just right off the bat here, this is a really wordy slide here, but you know, with the advanced imaging and modern electrophysiology, and the, the, the polling question is not as wordy. Um, you could see here, it says, with advanced imaging and modern electrophysiology, imaging and like OCT imaging and ERG testing, do we really need to be doing visual field tests in glaucoma? And, um, you know, this question here reminds me that, you know, visual fields, I could probably turn it into a four hour lecture. We can talk really probably in depth on 10-2s, get into the neuro type of visual field, what to do, what tests to order when you have the neuro visual field. Tonight, you know, I it just kind of focused on glaucoma. We might touch a little bit on neuro. Joe's expertise is in that area. He might see a couple of visual fields that he might want to talk about. Uh, so uh, with that being said, you know, with all this advanced OCT doing nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell complex, now we have OCT angiography looking at the radial peripapillary capillaries and retina density, which is equal to like the GCC complex. And we have ERGs and electrophysiology. Do we really need to be doing visual fields? You know, yes, no, or, and then yes, because you don't have an OCT to do. And it looks like we got a pretty good amount of <laughs> participation. Joe, thanks for launching the handouts. For those who want the handouts, there it's in the chat box. I'm gonna end the poll, share the results. And we have about 13% of the colleagues that answered this polling question. 
saying yes. We got 86% saying yes. And we got 1% saying no. So that's, uh, you know, I'm glad that warms my heart. You know, I see a lot of people relying on OCT, relying on, uh, you know, neurofiber layer GCC. I do do some chart reviews and, you know, a lot, a lot of times am I seeing visual fields being done yearly uh, on glaucoma patients. So uh, keep that in mind, maybe keep track of that in the office. Um, this next one here is just put in the chat box. I really don't need, didn't really want to make us into a polling question because I really didn't know all the instruments. But, you know, if you put in the chat box, it'd be great. You know, what visual field instrument or instruments, because I have two in my practice, um, that you have in your office that you're that you're doing because tonight this visual field lecture will I see octopus right off the bat um, it's going to focus on you know a lot of the Humphrey but all the concepts that I teach can be uh, applied to uh, and I see all the eyes that's good <laughs> FDT frequency doubling technology uh, I see OptiView but that's I'm not sure if they do a, a visual field frequency doubling, vis Humphrey visual field. Great. Keep them rolling in and I'm going to jump into here. So, you know, real, really quick off the bat, you know, visual fields, you know, perimetry, the future is exciting. I'll talk about some of the uh, wearable technology. I saw someone up there, uh, I think, but had all the eyes. That's a wearable technology. You know, should, Joe, I'm going to pose this question to you. Should visual fields be done on every glaucoma patient? I think we, uh, most everybody's going to say the same thing in, in agreement. Yes, you, we, we still do. You know, that's function. You know, it, it, it's hard to determine, you know, what, you know, how a nerve defect or neurofiber layer defect or a GCC defect will impact the patient's quality of life and their ability to, to drive, to, uh, to ambulate. And I can tell you because it, you know, as you as you know, I have uh, I do have a bent uh, in neuroop disease. Um, nothing really shows you what's going on uh, in neuroop, you know, such a uh, like a visual field. It, it really is critical. So we still have to we still have to do it. We may not like it. They're getting better. They're getting faster. They are pretty accurate. Uh, but we still have to do them in glaucoma. There's no question. It's, it's part of the standard of care. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you used those words there at the end, Joe, with focusing on, you know, standard of care. So Joe mentioned that it's the functional part, you know, be careful relying on that agreement um, with structure and function. A lot of times we see a lot of structure damage, don't have the function and vice versa. It's, you know, there's times when you can see the functional defect, you know, before you see some of the structural change. Usually it is structure than function, but, you know, discordance is high, which means agreement uh, is low. So just be aware that uh, when it comes to glaucoma, and again, tonight's we're going to really focus on the glaucoma this visual field. So, you know, let's jump in and bring some love back to the visual field. You know, there's been lots of changes over the years. Um, this is in the, you know, the Humphrey visual field, you know, starting off with that stat pack and then that short wavelength automated perimetry, getting into the CETA testing, and then some changes that have recently occurred in visual field testing uh, over the last you know, few years. Uh, CETA faster, now we got 24-2C uh, that's out there, data synchronization, so on and so forth. And we're gonna touch about some of these, but really we wanna really, as you guys know, when Joe and I lecture, we try to make these things clinical. So I don't want to get too much into the weeds tonight. I want to be able to be able to bring, uh, you know, when you go in the do a visual field tomorrow that you can, uh, you know, interpret these maybe a little bit higher, a little bit more comfortable way of doing it. I, if you don't mind, just go back two slides. I want to point yep. something out yep. uh, in terms of our advancement. I'm, I'm going to look right there at 19, uh, 1986, in between 1986 and 1988, we had Stat Pack and then Stat Pack Plus. And what a lot of people don't realize, you know, this is this was one of the early normative databases we've had in any devices. And what many people don't recognize or realize in 1986, when we were using Stat Pack in those years, the normative database consisted of 12 people. That was it. So we, we made a heck of a lot of clinical decisions based upon the normal values of 12 people in that device. 
Yeah. Hence the need for Stat Pack Plus. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a good point out here. Making a decision on what 12, 12 in a normative database. Now, we've come a long way. All right, so we kind of talked about maybe say if you want to say some of the, the older technology, some of the newer technology. I think I saw. Let me scroll up through here. I think yes, there's an Oculus. Uh, I think I saw an Ollie's eyes. This here is a Hero device. Wearables are coming. Um, you know, uh, out there, uh, I'll show a couple videos if we have time towards the end and what I'm showing here, this is my son. This is why I'm growing my crazy hair out. Here's my son wearing the technology. This was actually in a magazine article that I just published on kind of smaller technologies, uh, for the office, but you can see here's my Humphrey visual field. And then here's the, uh, the hero device, you know, wearable device that's in the practice, um, and really, I can turn really any exam room into a visual field, uh, and that's really important with COVID. And then some, you know, it's, it's not to say New York City is the only city that has Chicago, LA, you know, small spaces. Um, this, these wearable devices are now becoming very helpful in, you know, the, the higher cost of square foot like New York, Chicago, uh, where you don't have to have a whole visual field uh, room that's out there. So it's making, you know, the technology available. So, but sometimes it's better to, to, to go old school and, you know, here's a patient of mine. He's got uh, a, a pretty good glaucoma. I believe it's in his right eye. And I just kind of want to show you here. I'm going to play a video and you can see, I'm just using a red cap test. And as I get back in, you're going to see this video again, as I start connecting some dots here towards the end, but sometimes it's just good just to show the patient, watch He's going to laugh and smile because he really didn't realize it. So I'm just going to play the uh, the video here. Oop, hold on one second. You know what I'm going to do? I didn't share the audio. So I'm just going to hop off, see if I don't blow this up and take some time. Let's see. Share audio, share this, and oop, don't want to end the meeting. That was almost a disaster. All right. Let's see if this plays now. Joe, let me know if you hear this. Go ahead. All right. Can you see that red cap there? Yes. Perfect. It's red, right? Yes. What happens here? Gone completely. I want to make sure you're looking at my nose. And then it's gone, right? Yep. See it? Yep. You can definitely see it there, right? Definitely. I'm going to cover this eye. So obviously it's his left eye that has the cool. defect. Right. Keep I looking can't. at my nose. Watch what happens now. Tell me what happens. It's, I can see it, but I can't really see the red. It's kind of a shadow. Tan, tan color and Perfect. it's just starting to turn red now i can see the whole thing red. tell me when it disappears starting to change colors and i'm losing it there <laughs> okay thank you very much so you know remember those visual fields in that area over overlap and, you know, that's why I have this slide here next to kind of remind us that going superior is a 60 degree field and then going nasal is 60 degrees um, and then going uh, temporal is 100 degrees going temporal. This would be if I cover my, you know, my left eye, this would be in a sense looking out the right eye visual field, superior 60, nasal 60 inferior 75 but it's more down in this area where it becomes 75 you know you can see here maybe 72 71 inferior and then over here going temporally you get about that 100 remember the macula is a lot larger it's two disc diameters in the back of the eye if i've learned that by doing these zooms that we think the macula is actually the fovea remember the macula is two disc diameters in size so 13 degrees and then the fovea is about three degrees and obviously um, the visual field will be limited by orbits of the uh, margins of the orbit and bony structures and so on and so forth. Uh, so polling question number two that I have is, can one diopter of refractive air influence a glaucomatous visual field? Can one diopter of refractive air, now we're talking about a glaucomatous visual field, is that yes, no, and or not sure, and that's why I'm here. All right, so I'm going to take a look. A lot of Humphreys. I see OptiView in a couple of times. Does OptiView have a visual field now? I see some hellos. That could just be talking about the, their OCT. Okay, gotcha. All right. Mm. So, 
by shutting that down. I lost all of my, I got chat. Let's get the participants here. All right. All right, we got 82%. So I'm just gonna end the poll and share the results. And you can see here that 50% say uh, uh, yes. And we have 25 or 26% saying no. And we have 24% not sure. And that's why we're here. And makes me feel good that we talk about it when I see some of those people say not sure, because that's why we're here tonight to talk about these things. So with that being said, you know, here's some fun pearls on a, on a visual field. Uh, I'll jump down to bullet point number two to answer the polling question. One diopter of refractive blur in an undilated patient can influence the uh, decibel reading. So when we come over here on, a, uh, on the measurement side, the raw data here, um, it can influence it by a diopter. Uh, on the hill of vision. And that's important because, you know, most of our glaucoma patients, you know, they, they might be, if they're ocular hypertensives in their forties or fifties, but, you know, they're going to have glaucoma in their, you know, sixties and seventies and cataracts form at that time. So, you know, my technician does a really good job of not relying. I don't refract all my glaucoma patients every time they come in. Sometimes they don't get glasses for two years they're at the end of that two year cycle, but they have cataracts and create a refractive shift. So she'll just do a day of the, of the, uh, of the um, visual field. She'll just do an auto refractor compared to the glasses. And then she'll say, Hey, look, do you think we should refract the patient? Sometimes I just say, Hey, use what's in the auto refractor um, uh, that's out there uh, after discussing with the patient. So uh, that can affect with that being said, we'll stay on the theme of cylinder, you know, you can adjust with spherical, spherical equivalent up to two diopters. After two diopters, you want to start correcting that with a trial lens. This is a pretty good fact to know here when you start in interpreting the visual field. Most visual fields, and I see the list that everyone put in here, mo most of them go up to 51 diopters uh, that are out there. That's so cool. zero is the brightest light possible. And 51 is super, super dim. But the human vision cannot see anything 41 to 51. It's just outside. It's too dim. So that's why when you're looking at this data, this raw data, if you start seeing 41s, 42s, 43s, 51s, the patient is most likely trigger happy. You're probably going to see a lot of false positives on there. Now, I thought I was going to need to know, I went to PCO and I thought whenever Dr. Warmington taught the course that I would be using this pretty much every day that I needed to know that the background of the visual field was 31 apostilles. But the reason why that has happened is that that's the minimum amount of brightness to bring us into photopic or get us out of being dark adapted. And it, it isolates the cones and allows us uh, to get a more reliable uh, uh, test because yet you're, you're more on contrast and less on absolute brightness. Then with that being said, changes in pupil size, that crystalline lens color, that transparency has less effect. So that's why the back of the bowl is lit to get us into that pho photopic range, basically getting us a more reliable visual field. So static perimetry uh, in eye care, you can do it for neurological disease, retinal disease. You could do it in glaucoma. It's essential in the diagnosis and management. And then why test the central 24 or 30 degrees? We're going to talk in and dive a little bit deeper here on that. You know, why are we testing that central 24 or 30 and which one 24 or 30? Only a small percentage of glaucoma defects occur in that peripheral uh, visual field alone. If it is peripheral, you have central. And that's why testing the 24 or 30 degree visual field is preferred in glaucoma management. And if, if you think about it, most of the ganglion cells are within that 30 degrees of fix, fixation. So, you know, when, when we do 24 versus 32, the 30 2, if you would count them up, and this is not a 30 2, as you can see here, it's only going 24, 24, and 24. This has 54 spots. If it tests out to these 30 degrees here, uh, then we get 76 spots. But 
I want, I just had a new technician start at the office today. She came from actually a glaucoma, this, uh, a glaucoma specialist doc. And it was kind of funny. She's like, do you do 30 dash twos or 24 dash twos? And I said, 24 dash twos. And we had this discussion while the doctors 30 dash twos. And I said, well, don't forget that the 24 dash two tests over to 30 degrees nasally. So with that being said, you get little diagnostic information loss. It saves time. And then you don't get those trial lens errors. If you look right here, we have a plus two, you start getting plus five lenses in there. You can start getting those trial lens defects that occur. But we all know that glaucoma creates that nasal visual field. That's kind of the, the sacred ground of glaucoma. So we do go out the 30 nasally uh, on a 24 2. So most glaucoma docs uh, attending the Optometric Glaucoma Society meeting, um, which uh, I'm a member and Joe's a member of. And Joe, are you a founding member of OGS? I know you're, you're the Retina Society, but OGS, I know you're one of the originals, but uh, are you a founding? Yeah, I was, one, I was one of the founding members. So Joe being OGS has been to many of these meetings. And Joe, do you agree um, that most glaucoma docs do 24 dash twos? Yes. So, you know, with, you know, with that being said, you know, I'm not here to change anyone. We're just here to try and bring, you know, what's being done out there and reasons why. So 24 dash two has become the visual field for glaucoma. The only downside of a 30 dash two is sometimes you might pick up progression slightly earlier. That's the only downside that's out there. I'm just going to hit these real quick to kind of remind us, you know, when it comes to visual fields, you know, standard automated perimetry, it just determines the threshold or how dim the light is. And then the Swedish interactive threshold algorithms basically just optimize the determination of that. So, we have standard automated perimetry, then we have the algorithm to kind of help us out and decrease that visual field by 50% testing. And remember, this CETA can be applied to the standard or this short wavelength automated perimetry that's out there. Within the CETA standard versus CETA fast, I get this question a lot, like what do you do in your practice? Do you, for your glaucoma patient, do you do CETA standard or do CETA fast? The CETA strategy, remember, are twice as fast as the older strategies. And CETA fast takes 67% of the time, or you know, it's about a third quicker than CETA standard. So you're not, you know, a third of the time, you know, times two, I guess, you know, both eyes. You know, is that enough for me to say I'm gonna do CETA fast? No, I like CETA standard, and you're gonna see why here in a second. So the primary difference between the two strategies is the amount of certainty that is required before the testing is stopped. So CETA standard is a little bit more precise. It tolerates mistakes, and it's uh, an easier test as stimuli are brighter. And as you can see here, you know, this is a dim, just showing dim and bright here. This is the hill of vision that we're all seeing. And when you do a CETA a fast, it crosses the threshold only once. So you can see they saw it, they saw it, they didn't see it here. And then it tries to guess about where it is on that CETA fast. When it does see the standard, it actually crosses twice, but then it also goes in smaller steps, right? So you have that four-step decibel difference, but when it comes back that second time, it's coming down in two. So what you're seeing here is it kind of nails it down to become more precise that's out there. Joe, any comments on see the standard, see the, this hill of vision that you want to make? Yeah, I think that... Uh... The CETA fast was developed because they needed a kind of a screening uh, strategy uh, in this uh, in this device. But because of what you just described, Greg, it had it, it really accepts a greater degree of uncertainty as to where to stop. So I think that CETA fast, while it has been used, and it's good for obvious things, certainly good for neuro op. Uh, I think that CETA fast is falling uh, falling aside uh, in favor of CETA faster, which I know you're going to talk about. But uh, there there is some question about the reliability of CETA fast. Now, if you can't get a you can't you have an older person or a short attention span person, you can't do anything better. CETA fast is is good for that. Uh, 
But given the choice between standard or fast, probably standard is better. I think fast is going to disappear. It's going to give way to say the faster. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And just as you said, Joe, here, see the faster coming soon. Nope, not coming soon. It is now here. So with that being said, I have a following question on that. And maybe I should have launched it while you were talking about that. But are you familiar with the see the faster program that's out there? Are you familiar with that strategy, basically? <laughs> All right. And Any... if, and if you're not, if, if for the audience, if you're not that familiar with it, don't don't feel badly about it. I've I've done these conferences where glaucoma specialists weren't aware of it. It is, I mean, in the newer Humphrey devices, it is ubiquitous. It, it is out there. It's not a, a rare thing, but uh, in, in fact, it may even be on people's uh, device right now. They don't even know it. That, that is true, and I'm not sure about some of these newer devices. Um, I don't think it's proprietary. I think it's just a strategy. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. if some of the newer devices are going to, to have it or not. So we're talking about. So with that being said, we got well above our 80% or a little bit above our 80%. And uh, we're going to stop there. And we have 23%, about a quarter. We have 13% uh, uh, not sure and 64% you know, uh, not aware of this. So just we're going to talk about this. Be aware of it. Um, because, you know, like I said, I don't think it's proprietary to Humphreys. I think it's just a strategy and you might see it popping up. You might already have it on your device. Good point, Joe. And you might see it popping up. So what does CETA Faster do? CETA Faster turns off the false negatives. It turns off the blind spot, leaves false positives on and uses gaze tracking uh, as really the reliability. You know, I'm going to talk about why did they turn off the blind spot? You know, how many times have you plotted the blind spot? The person is sitting in the Humphrey. The technician says, OK, we're going to start the test. And they pull their head out and go, what was that? I missed what you said after they just plotted the blind spot. And the other thing, too, is the blind spot is only a certain size. And if the patient just moves a little bit and and a little circle falls outside that blind spot, because when they test the blind spot, they're using the brightest light. If it just hits a few uh, photoreceptors, the patient's going to see it because it's the brightest light. So the patient could be fixating great. They could have shifted a little bit, hitting a few photoreceptors, and boom, they, they get 13 for 13, but then their eyes start, uh, is, is still. The other, uh, with turning off the false negatives, and I, hopefully we'll see this as we go through and show some visual fields, but remember, false negatives on a visual field that's glaucoma is, is kind of expected. Now that we understand and we see it a lot in a perfectly taken visual field, if you think about that retina ganglion cell, that's what dies in glaucoma. That's what's damaging, right? The retina ganglion cell, which is in that macula area, the axon goes through the nerve fiber layer, over through the nerve, back through the, uh, the, uh, through the, you know, the, the orbit, out the orbit, and then synapses in the lateral geniculate body. That is a long fiber and a ganglion cell. And when it's being stressed, and it's dying, you know, that ganglion cell doesn't die from good to death. There's a process, right? Wounded, a little bit more wounded. It's really getting wounded. Okay, it's to the point now it's going to die. If you catch it early, it can't recover, right? If it's, it's like, you know, I always use the analogy, like I could probably go run a 5K right now if I wanted, but I have, I have patients that run 5Ks all the time. They'd run it in, you know, 18 minutes. I could do mine probably in about 28. And, but when I'm said and done, they're like, okay, I'm going to go home and cut the grass now where I run through the finish line, lay down, huffing and puffing. They recover a little bit quicker. That's what happens with a healthy retinal ganglion cell. In glaucoma, whenever they're damaged, it takes them longer to recover. So expect false negatives to be high. That's why in CETA faster, they turned it off. So that's what's happened in CETA faster. False negatives are off, blind spot off, and we're using false positives because false positives will kill a visual field um, at all. There's some glaucoma docs that go, it's 2%. I can't interpret it. 
you know, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that strict in my office, but false positives are bad for a glaucoma in this visual field. So faster test with the same reliability. So here is, you know, in a sense, a CETA faster. You can see the strategy is right here. If you go over, you can see zero were tested. So zero for zero, false positive, 13%. The false negatives are off. So blind spot is off, false negatives are off. And we're using the blind spot here to see what's happening. And you could see that there's, you know, a glaucomatous in a sense, maybe defect showing up here. And because the false positives are high here, that's why like, hey, it should get better going this way. Why is it getting worse? The patient was a little trigger happy. The hill of vision was a little bit higher than expected for someone 63 years old and it pushed it down in this area right here. And that's why we went from a total deviation. We expect it to get better because most of the time we're gonna raise the visual field, but the pattern deviation got worse because of these false positives. And that's why I like showing how a false positive can really trash a visual field. So false positives usually aren't really good. Um, and this is just showing a progression analysis and showing here that how you can mix and match these strategies, because right here, you can see it was a CETA standard. Here's a CETA standard. And yes, here's a CETA faster being able to be merged with, uh, uh, with this. Joe, any in, comments in, at this point? In, interestingly, it wasn't all that long ago, the cognoscente in glaucoma you would tell everybody, you can't mix and match. You know, you, you can't have full threshold and see the standard and see the fast. And they, they, they weren't clinically, they weren't equivalent. So you really couldn't merge them. The guided progression analysis wouldn't accept them. Well, that's all changed now. And interesting, I agree with what you're saying about pattern deviation there, Greg, if you go back one. You know, when you see a pattern deviation that's worse than total, you have to worry that there may be some issues with reliability. But a paper just that actually came out that looked at uh, things in the central, paracentral area, and I can't give you the, the, the chapter and verse, but basically they said, uh, in, in certain situations where the pattern deviation is worse than a total in the paracentral area, it may actually be reliable. There you go. So as we move forward here, I want to kind of show you that, you know, here we got these, this defect here, about seven spots, maybe eight. And we're mean deviation is minus 0 0.21 and the pattern standard deviation is two. We're going to talk about that here. So just remember that visual field. And then this is just a paper, and obviously this is by Humphrey showing that CETA FAST results are equivalent to CETA FAST and CETA standard. Um, the last OGS meeting, I'm going to launch this poll as I make that comment, is, and let's see what the question is, and I'll make that comment. Do you consider glaucoma a disease of the macula? Yes, no, or not sure, and that's why I'm here. Um, what was I going to, oh, at the last OGS meeting, um, they felt that the CETA faster was a little bit sloppy and maybe trying to nail down that glaucomatous progression. So I can tell you, you know, I look for clinical pearls. Um, I kind of realized that in my practice. So I still do for glaucoma patients 24-2 CETA standard fovea on. And then if and I rely on my technician, Sarah's awesome. I rely on technician and a few other technicians in the practice. Um, but when she feels that the patient has graduated enough to go to see the faster, that's when we'll do it. Because as you saw, we can mix and match those, see the standards, so on and so forth. But if they're still not getting it, a little bit sloppy, we stay see the standard. If the patient is an expert in a sense or, you know, graduates to becoming a, a good visual field test taker, then we take them up to see the faster to help out. All right. So do you consider glaucoma disease of the macula? All right. All right, people, we're getting to about 79% taking that. So make sure you answer these polling questions, please, to make it interactive. Um, the answer, we got 53% majority saying yes. And uh, we got 38% saying no and 9% uh, not sure. All right. So 
Let me get this set for number five. And so the, the answer is yes, it's a disease of the macula. And that's why you're going to see a strategy coming up here, 24-2C. Um, we, if we do a 24-2, the visual field could be clean, but yet a 10-2 can pick up in that macular area. But more importantly, when you look at this OCT and we look at this rim that's on the outside, and this is a patient with glaucoma, you can see here inferior uh, nasal, um, oh geez, whew, inferior temporal, we have a, uh, a, a, a nerve fiber layer defect that's showing up here on the T-SNT. So inferior temporal, that's the glaucoma prone zone, superior temporal, inferior temporal. You can see how it's matching this ganglion cell loss, but where is the ganglion cell? The ganglion cell is in the macula, right? The, the ganglion cell layer just outside the fovea in that pair E uh, pair E fovea areas where those ganglion cells are housed. So we start kind of making that correlation that remember glaucoma is a MAC disease of the macula because that's where the ganglion cell death is happening. Um, that's why a 10-2 becomes important. So kind of think of glaucoma as kind of a macular disease uh, in, that, in that sense. So when you look at uh, an OCT and you look at the ganglion cell layer, again, I was showing you here, and sometimes this is what I do. I'll open up the OCT, look at the individual scans. Here's your ganglion cell layer. This is the fovea layer. This is the pair up, uh, pair E fovea layer, whole retina, nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layer, that inner plexiform layer. And what happens, I'll show you here. This is a glaucomatous uh, patient down here. This is normal, right? That's why I opened this up. I like to see what's going on here. That looks good. That looks good. These are normal patients. Look at this here in the macula area. This ganglion cell is healthy. This area is damaged from glaucoma. So is glaucoma a disease of the macula? It certainly is. That's out there. So that's why we do GCC testing, ganglion cell testing. That's why we do 10-2s. And that's why the strategy of 24-2C, which we're going to talk about here, I know we haven't talked about, will be coming up. And that's what this is here. CETA, faster, 24-2C. I'm going to talk about how this came about. I'll show you what it looks like on a visual field. You can see central 24-2C. Again, 24 degrees superior, inferior, temporal, going 30 degrees nasal. And then on top of it, you can see there's an extra 10 spots put in here in that strategy to test the macula. So it's kind of a partial 10-2 mixed in with a 24-2. And it takes on this kind of C pattern, that's why they call it, or a central two, kind of that C pattern, that central pattern that's out there. And you can see how many more glaucoma in that center area. This is a patient with glaucoma are now being picked up. This is the left eye. Here's a patient with glaucoma in my practice. And you can see a few more of these macular uh, points have been picked up in this 24-2C. Joe, any comments on 24-2C? Uh, I have been using it and I hate to say, I, I don't find it visually uh, appealing to me. Uh, I am, I am, I have actually gone back to 24-2, you know, the, uh, without the C and if necessary, I will do the, uh, the 10 degree fields. Uh, I've, I've not adopted it. I, I don't like it. I, I don't know why it's hard for me to say why I don't like it. I, it's something about, I, I, I don't dig on it. Right. And here's what I do in my practice. You're looking for some clinical. When I start seeing this happening, I start seeing ganglion cell death. Do I want to do a 10-2 and a 24-2? So do I do 24-2s on everyone? The answer is no. When I start seeing some cell loss like here in this OCT, now I want to start getting in and maybe doing 10-2s or 24-2Cs. So that's really what I rely on is if I'm starting to pick up some cellular death here, in that ganglion cell, do I, do I really make sure I'm getting a 10, especially if my, uh, my, my um, 
uh, 24-2 C to standard is clean, I'll get to the 10-2 or at least order a 24-2 C. So if, if you're looking for some clinical or if anyone has any other clinical advice, we'll keep an eye on the chat box. But that's kind of my pearls for tonight. Now, anytime you see Don Hood's name, like, you know, every time I see that out and see it in publication, I usually read it because Don Hood has spent his life in this whole kind of perimetry area. And you can see that these experts got together and really kind of picked these areas right here, looking at a a 10 2 pattern, really kind of picking the spots that kind of show up on glaucoma uh, 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 patients. So, those are the ones most likely to be affected. So, there was some science put behind it. They just didn't randomly pick up again. Here's your expert, you know, and again, Don Hood here. But what they're showing in this paper here is the 10 or the 24 2, you can see. Within this kind of 10 2 area, one, two, three spots would be picked up. So both are abnormal the 10 2, the 24 2. But if you jump down here, you can see that the, the 24 2 is normal. But if you run a 10 2, you start getting some of the glaucoma defects. So again, you know, this would probably have some ganglion cell loss, and maybe I'd run a 10 2 and a 24 2 C. And then here we're showing where the 10 2 is normal, the macula is not involved, but you could see that we're getting kind of that uh, kind of classic, uh, you know, para. Uh, central type of, uh, of defect that's there. So that's why I'm just bringing out that, you know, don't forget about that 10-2 area. Don't forget about the macula. Glaucoma is a macular disease. And again, by using that expert group, this is the 10 points that they came up with to do that 24-2 C pattern that's on the Humphrey visual field three. But again, I didn't really go through and pull all the other instruments, whether it's on that other instruments or not. So again, just kind of showing here, you know, here's a patient with the total deviation going over here, the pattern, you could see the areas that are involved and in being tested in this glaucoma patient, see this nice inferior arcuate defect, and you can see that uh, we're picking up in some of the, you know, the, uh, the central macula areas that are involved. And in all honesty, um, Joe, and this is what I do, and I'm just, maybe I'm a little off on this, but when I start seeing that macula involved, I kind of stick to my target pressure, kind of keep it um, uh, a little bit tighter control. Um, not that I'm trying to show, I guess, preferential over macula versus paracentral. But when I start seeing that macula involved, kind of in glaucoma, it starts to, you know, pitter pat my heart a little bit. What's your thoughts on that? Well, when we start having the par these paracentral defects, we worry that they're going to extend and extinguish fixation. And we have to be very, very cognizant of that and, and probably insist on a, uh, a lower target pressure or a tighter adherence to what our target pressure or maybe even doing feels a little bit more frequently. But a paper just came out actually looking at uh, paracentral defects in glaucoma for patients, and their conclusion was that uh, the paracentral defects didn't adversely affect the patient's quality of life. So while they, you know, while they're there, they probably affect our quality of life more than the patient's quality of life. Believe it or not. Great. So a question came in. I see it, Keith. It says typical time for 24-2C. Couldn't have timed that any better. Thank you for the timing of that question because right here I have a 24-2C to faster. And you can see it was two minutes and 55 seconds. Jumping over here to this 24-2C to standard. And this was six minutes and 40 seconds. So here is a test that was six minutes and 40 seconds. Um, patient of mine in the practice um, I knew had some macular damage using that structural testing. And that's why sometimes I think that discordance is high because you go, wow, look at that GCC loss. And look, the visual field is clean, right? Or maybe there's some, something showing up on the total deviation here. And then you jump over the pattern. Wow, it looks clean. But again, getting the, if you want to say appropriate test, you know, 
uh, crime must fit the punishment, the ganglion cell was involved. And then all of a sudden you run this test, which is a shorter test by two minutes, you know, two, it's two minutes, 55 seconds versus six minutes and 40 seconds. And we start getting these central defects uh, being picked up. So again, uh, Keith, thanks for that, uh, for that timing. Um, this is the other eye. Again, the patient came in. Um, I think this is the other eye. Let me make sure. Yep, that was the right eye. This is the left eye. Again, clean. Coming over here, picking up on that defect. This time was a, a few 15 seconds longer um, or maybe yeah, nine seconds longer uh, at three minutes and four seconds. And we have one over here at, three, at six minutes and 26 seconds. Again, showing a clean pattern deviation but you can see that the glaucomatous, the macula was being involved here, um, being picked up on this 24-2C. But again, I kind of do this test when I know, like way back when I showed that OCT, especially in that one that was on the right eye, I would expect with that amount of damage that there should be something, one of those spots would probably be popping up on a 24-2, but it's always, you know, that, that, that adhere, that, uh, that that agreement is not always there. All right. Polling question number five. Do you, uh, we do you consider now? I know it's a repeat, but we're going to see if there's a change. Do you now consider glaucoma a disease of the macula? Yes, no, or not sure. That's why I'm here. Same question, but after we did that little process, just seeing if uh, seeing if you consider it uh, a a uh, disease of the macula. Yeah, interestingly, and you don't have to go back, Greg, but your last two clinical examples of the right and left eye, it was only a few years ago, we would call that pre-parametric glaucoma, meaning that there is uh, there's glaucoma structural damage, but there's no glaucoma functional damage. But I guess if we start testing a little bit better and tighter, we might find that uh, the true pre-parametric glaucoma isn't as prevalent as we thought. Yeah, that's exactly, Joe, whenever at the very beginning, at the very, when I said visual fields are becoming exciting, Again, the, we're starting to understand this a little bit more, and now we're getting the testing, and it's starting to become a little bit tighter. Yeah, so this is the exciting part. Joe, check this out. Look at the uh, look at that results. It's like the second time this has ever happened. We've got one hundred percent in one of the answers. So that's uh, that's pretty good. So uh, yes, glaucoma is a disease of the macula. All right. And all the polling times uh, that we've done, we've only had a couple times where we've had 100%. So thanks, everyone. All right. Foveal threshold on or off. You know, remember, most instruments can test up to 51 decibels. A perfect macula on a well-trained young person, 19, 20 years old, can get up to about 40 decibels. Uh, 40 decibels. Visual acuity and the fovea should correlate. That's why I like doing it. Um, you can validate each other. It's kind of a little bit of a warm up uh, that's out there. And when you look at the literature, 47% of the patients with 20 20 vision have about a, a 37 decibel when you do that uh, foveal uh, threshold. So I like fovea on. I know Joe has a pearl where sometimes the patient forgets to check fixation and they're still looking down rather than back up at that center dot. So that's a clinical pearl that we need to be aware of. Make sure that you know, the fixation, the patient does move their eye. Um, it could be glaucoma damage. It could be plaquenil toxicity. I picked up a plaquenil toxicity one time going, hmm, this patient's 2020. Why is there decibels like 29 and we went back and did some 10-2 testing and so on and so forth and found early Plaquenil uh, toxicity uh, on that patient. So when you look at the, you know, if I have these where the fovias, you know, are off, you know, I, I would say to my technician, please next time put on the, the, uh, the fovea there. But you know, typically if they're 20, 20, 35 decibels, 36, 37, you start getting, that's another way to check reliability. All of a sudden you get a foveal threshold that's 45. Well, they're just trigger happy, right? So that's another way that you can use that foveal threshold uh, as looking for disease and checking for reliability. Now that we know that about 37 is, uh, is about average in 47% of the patients. 
short wavelength automated perimetry. This was that blue yellow where it used the Goldman uh, five stimulus on a yellow background, right? We have uh, blue, green, and red photoreceptors, blue being the least amount. So if you wiped out a hundred and uh, photoreceptors, you're going to wipe out a few more of those blues and maybe pick up on that glaucoma, that reduced redundancy type of theory. With the new strategies that come out, white on white picks up just as early as these, this blue on yellow. So the short wavelength automated perimetry kind of was good back in the day, but then with the new strategies kind of got shoved away with the white on white because of the, of the newer thresholding strategies that's out there. So glaucoma visual field, um, this is just kind of a reminder of what I do in the practice. You need a current refraction. Remember cataracts can cause a refractive shift. We talked about that one diopter. We talked about the cylinder. We have 24 2s. That's what I like to do. You can do a 30 2 if you want, but I like 30 2 minimizes that rim defect. I like C to standard, not C to fast. Again, tightening the amount that it crosses those thresholds. As the patient graduates, I can go to C to faster. 24 2 Cs, if I think that the uh, macula is involved or if I'm seeing some ganglion cell drop out and it's not picking up on the white on white or on my CETA standard. And I like that fovea uh, being on. And those would be my recommendations when coming and doing a glaucoma, this visual field. Joe, any comments, anything that you thought about? Uh, I mentioned about your, you know, the fovea on and the patient looking down, making sure we get them up because sometimes you can get some really funky visual field defects, but uh, any comments? No, no, that that would that's what I would have uh, I would have mentioned you when you when they if they don't change fixation afterwards, you don't have a good perimetrist, you know it'll shift everything down and make you think the patient is getting worse when they actually probably are not. So in coming and interpreting visual fields, we used to say, all right, it's reliable or unreliable. And when you look at some of the primers that are out there, it's not really used anymore. It's whether it's a continuum of a high reliable or just you know marginally in informative. So I try to interpret just about every visual field that's out there. Just sometimes you're not getting as much information as you would if it was highly reliable. You know, false positives, again, we talked about that and I'm gonna show you examples. Trigger happy just wipes out that glaucoma this visual field. False negatives are expected, right? I went through that long talk winded about a ganglion cell when it's wounded, it's a little longer to recover. So if you hit it with a light and it thresholds it and you come back and you expect it to be the same it's not because it's wounded. It takes a little bit more time to recover. So that's why you expect false negatives maybe being high on a reliable visual glaucoma this visual field, even in the best uh, uh, tentative uh, test taker that's out there. And we rely more on that gaze monitor rather than the blind spot. Progression is not really if it's absent or present, it's just whether that rate of progression uh, is acceptable. So you kind of expect, you know, over time and there's adjustments for age that the visual field is going to progress from the time that say we're 20 to the time that we're 80. But is that rate of progression acceptable or is it going down quicker than we really want it? Now, this is a different false positive. This is, you know, this is that other false positive. And, you know, when it comes to visual fields, the patient can stink, they can't understand it, but if you kind of coach them and teach them, and if they're coachable, you can test out of a bad visual field when it comes to functional testing. When it comes to structure testing, you know, this patient here, this is a totally normal, this is a whole other lecture that I do on OCT, but this is too symmetric, right? 81, 81, 81, 81. It's not glaucoma. It's just a general loss. You got some blue, you got some blue. It's, it's very symmetric. 253, 254, 243, 243 here. Glaucoma is asymmetric. It's worse than one eye. This stuff here, this is not glaucoma. This is a totally physiologically normal OCT I can repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and blink and dilate and tears. It's a structural issue. And it's going to be tested against that normative database. As many times as I do this, it's always going to show up. But you can test and coach and get people out of that false positive that's out there. So I just heard that one time being discussed. And I just thought that was worth 
putting into uh, this discussion. So imagery is tip typically very repeatable. Again, it's going to show up. But when you're doing a function testing, uh, you can get, you know, depending on the patient, you know, they could have a lot of things going on in their mind and they're not focused. Um, and then you kind of have to get them refocused. All right. Did you get that one, Joe? Yeah, right. got him. All right. So here we go. Do you consider a mean deviation of minus five loss on the visual field significant? Yes, no. And I'm not going to have the, that's why I'm here, just on a visual field test. Minus five, do you consider it significant? All right, not seeing any questions rolling in. All right, participants are doing better, please. Yep, please answer that out there for those who are multitasking, try to answer the question so we can get that percentage up. So, all right. Perfect. We're going to end the poll, share the results. And the majority, 83% here, are saying that a minus five is a significant uh, amount of, of damage. So very good. All right. Let's see. All right. So with this minus five on a visual field, mean deviation, we're talking mean deviation, five decibel loss, when you review the literature, you see that even when they get to minus five, they a patient reads slower. Uh, they don't leave home as much, walk slower, and have increase in car accidents. So just remember that when you're seeing someone and testing their visual field, remember zero is normal, plus is mean, probably usually trigger happy, minus one, minus two, minus three. And they get to minus five, these are the things that start happening. Remember, reading slower maybe because it's a macular disease. It's a it's a it's an asymmetric disease. So now you're getting, you know, impulses and stimuli getting back to the eye maybe at little at different at different rates and causing them to read slower. Um, uh, they, you know, again, not leaving home as much, those increased car accidents and walking slower. So with that being said, this is a little tricky. I'm going to see if I can pull this off by showing you what I'm going to do here. With that being said, you have this person with this inferior defect, okay? Which of these presentations, see this big inferior defect? Come over here and you'll see which of these visual fields here is this. And it's not polling question number one. It's polling question number seven. That visual field that I'm showing you right here, how does this patient see? Is it like this kind of tunnel vision? Is it this advanced glaucoma? Is it this kind of little defect or do they have normal vision? Which one, uh, which one is it? Does this defect here, this big, look, these are all zeros, can hardly see the light all the way around. Which visual field here, this extreme glaucoma, this advanced, are they seeing this kind of tunnel vision? Can't really see these people. And I'll go back. It's kind of hard to do it. This visual field in this left eye, and let's pretend it's bilateral, it's equal. I told you it's asymmetric, but let's just say it's this minus 14 mean deviation, which one of these represents? All right, a little bit tougher question here. We gave it a minute and a half. I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna end it and share the results here. Oop, let's see, I seem to hit a button and skipped forward. All right, so here we're all over the place. We have B, this one here. Uh, being the most at 43%. We have extreme glaucoma. And I, I'm going to show you that video again of that patient. And then I'm going to have Joe, I'm going to have you explain the slide I think you're probably familiar with uh, that's out there. So remember, we have this patient that has these zeros, can't see down in this area, but yet it's really none of these, right? It's maybe normal vision, but yet not normal vision. Because remember, the brain fills in. So it's not really any of these things that we've been taught. 
And it kind of goes back to this person here. Remember when I showed you this in his left eye, you know, he has both eyes open. But I said to this patient, and his wife is behind me, and I should have videotaped it. I said, by chance, do you, do you kind of trip and stumble from time to time? And his wife goes, well, yeah, he does. How did you know that, Doc? Well, when we get to this point, well, Joe, why don't you explain this slide here um, and where we're going with this? And then I'll go back and show that video. Well, actually, if you go, if you go two, two slides back to your initial one, yeah, this, no, no, not, 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 I'll go back. Well, actually, stay right there for, I'm oh, sorry, just stay there for a second, the visual field. Okay. Go back one. Yep. Yeah, here's a problem. We we don't represent this well. We we show this, but it's not what patients see. I mean, it's easy to, to educate. It's easy for us to understand. It's not reality. Go right ahead. And these patient education uh, uh, brochures here, is really doing a service because you know patients would think, well, I don't have any of that, so I must be fine. And that is not what a glaucoma patient sees, or I should say, doesn't see. And if you want to go ahead just a little bit to the next one, this is what happens. Okay, in upper left, you see everything is normal, everything is there. You've got an inferior arc scotoma on the upper right. The kids aren't there. Part of the car isn't there. It isn't black. It just isn't there. You know, your, your, blind, your physiological blind spot, if you close your eye, you can plot it out with your finger. It doesn't look black. It just isn't there. And as, as the field gets worse, there's just more things missing in the visual field. And that is really what's happening. They just don't see it. And if you test yourself looking for your own physiological blind spot, it doesn't look black. And situation like this, a nice little uh, superior arachoscotoma, you know, things, things are not going to end well for grandma here. Yeah. So as Joe mentioned that, you know, the brain fills it in, right? My dad has a right homonymous. He doesn't sit here and tell me all the time, hey, everything's black over here. He bumps into the door. He's used to it now. He knows that it's there. He knows he can't see over there, but he's not, he's, it's black and over he can see, but he bumps into door jams. And I've learned to walk in that blind spot for him so that if he does, if you know we're walking in a crowd and we're all stopping and he doesn't get stopped in time, he bumps into me and then he looks over and sees me, but it's not black that's out there. So that's why we go back and I show this patient and his wife sitting in the room. And I said, you know, hey, do you happen to stumble? And that's because when, you know, there's things on his left side, uh, down in that nasal area where the visual field might not be overlapping, it could be like a, an uneven area, a curb, uh, a, a garbage can, a pet or something along that way. And he, he stumbles because, again, that's why I'm showing him he doesn't see down here in this area. So that's just a reminder. Let me just uh, show you. Can you see again. that red cap there? Yes, I can. Okay. It's red, right? Yes. What happens here? Go on completely. Go on. Make sure you're looking at my nose. And then it's gone, right? Yep. See it? Yep. You can definitely see it there, right? Definitely. I'm going to cover this eye. Is it gone? It's, it's gone, yeah. Okay. I, I Keep can. looking at my nose. Watch what happens now. Tell me what happens. It's, I can see it, but I can't really see the red. It's kind of a shadow tan tan color and Plus, it's just starting to turn red now i can see the whole thing red. tell me when it disappears starting to change colors and i'm losing it there <laughs> okay thank you very much so joe we're getting questions uh, in the chat box it says where mm -hmm. can you get the photo of that depiction to show patients I believe, you know, we were doing the Maryland course a few years back when you presented this and I asked you for the slides and pirated it and put it into my talk. Um, so do you have any, do you know, where these came from by chance? They're well, probably Google images. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> where, where we get everything to the internet. All right. Let's see. My understanding is that a visual field before or after dilation does not affect the results very much, but that visual field should never be done while patient's eyes are in the process of dilating, waiting for a full dilation. I would also see some clarification as to why. Um, so again, that goes back to, um, you know, 
that's why the back of the bolt is lit. Um, I try not to, uh, you do a dilated uh, visual field, um, but at times you can, um, you know, you're, you're supposed to put in the pupil size when you do the visual field. So if you do dilate them, just put in the pupil size and that will help with the calculations at least on the Humphrey visual field. Um, but again, that's why the back of the bowl was lit to kind of minimize that. You're not relying on that absolute uh, brightness. Joe, any comments on the pupil dilation? Well, I agree. I mean, uh, not dilating, dilated or undilated and should be consistent. Uh, so you don't have fluctuation. But I agree about that part, not while they're dilating. And uh, very helpful. Okay, that's just a comment. Oh, you're, and you're when and when I'm things. describing the visual fields to patients, I'm I'm very I'm very fastidious about explaining. It. I know you don't see this. You don't see black. It just isn't there. And we also talk about the physiologic blind spot that we all have, but we can we can plot it out with our finger. But it isn't black. And just that's I think that's the best uh, description for them. So interpreting a visual field, you know, diagnostic plots, the hemi field test, mean deviation, visual field in, uh, index. This is just my kind of opinion. I use probability plots in the hemi field test for the diagnosis, image staging of the disease and following it over time is more mean deviation in that visual field index. The probability plots, total deviation, the pattern. We expect this to happen, right? We expect the total deviation to over time in a 48-year-old, I'm not sure how much media opacity would be, but that's the whole idea with the proprietary software. You can see here 35 decibels. That's a 2020 patient, 48 years old. I like it. And what we're seeing here is that pattern deviation gets better. Uh, pretty reliable, right? False positives are not really destroying it. False negatives. And it's just kind of raising that hill of vision. And that's why we see that pattern standard deviation happen. But you can see here, the false positives are too high, trigger happy. So what you're seeing here in this total deviation in these spots in this area right here, where they're actually normal because they tested good in that area and they were trigger happy, it pushes that hill of vision down making these, in a sense, normal spots abnormal and taking these abnormal spots where they were trigger happy and pushing them down to maybe, if you want to say normal, you can kind of see this kind of whitish area here. You can see uh, the patient had a 5%. I'm not sure how unreliable this one would be, but they're saying abnormal sensitivity. You can see here at 63 years old, they're a plus two above uh, what they are. So it's just throwing some caution to the wind. Maybe it's a total deviation, which is totally normal, but just follow this patient over time. All right. Uh, if you, if you st go back and just stay on that one for a moment, yeah. uh, I deviate a little bit uh, from others and what you, what you have said, Greg, I'm a little more forgiving of false positives. Uh, I mean, we can't throw them into a progression analysis, but I've seen patients with a fairly significant number of false positives where I actually, based upon what I see anatomically and past visual fields, I know it's pretty representative of the visual field and I can accept it, but the abnormally high sensitivity is my, is my threshold. When that comes up, we really can't use, we can't use that at all. That is, I mean, it doesn't look terrible, but once they say abnormally high sensitivity, you really can't use anything in the visual field. You know, maybe, you know, mean deviation, maybe a half to plus one at most. Above that, you know, two, that's just too high, 2.22. You point out phobia is 38 decibels. You know, this is actually, this is actually a quiet little visual field. This, this is trying to sneak in as being reliable because it doesn't look all that bad, but the abnormally high sensitivity is really devastating here. So there you, thank you very much. Anything else? No, I don't think. Oh, actually, uh, one thing I thought you were talking about going total deviation, paddle, pattern deviation. Uh, when I do a visual field, I always, you know, my right eye, I always have general reduction of sensitivity. And you usually equate that with a cataract. Well, I don't have a cataract. I've had cataract surgery. And I don't have a capsule. I've had capsule. I got bad vitreous. 
I'm comfortable with 2020, but I got bad vitreous. When I do a visual field like this, a white on white, it, you know, it, it always gives me general reduction sensitivity in my right eye. You're talking personally, right, Joe? Yeah, personally, yes. Right. Joe, Joe, just everyone knows. I got a little bit lost in there. I just want to clarify. Joe's had cataract surgery, yag capsulotomies. That was Joe taking that visual field, his personal experience, right? Yeah. Joe? Yeah. And I've got bad vitreous and that shows up as uh, almost like a cataract, but it isn't. Perfect. All right. So this is what happens when someone becomes sleepy, right? You have a few false positives. But, you know, this is the person it's like, oh, geez, I got to pick up the kids. I got to balance my bank. I got to run to the bank. I got to do some grocery store. Why do I have to do this test? It's taking nine minutes out of my life. So what's happening is they're, they're not really paying attention. The macular ones they see, they hit it and they just forget about the peripheral ones. And that's why you can kind of see this clover leaf or this butterfly pattern. You can quickly come up here and probably see that the false positives or false negatives are high. The time is high. We got an 86 year old person down to, you know, 26. They didn't really get the fovea, especially if they're 2020. They didn't get the fovea testing. This is just a very sleepy visual field that cloverleaf butterfly kind of zoning out. So mean deviation, um, you know, like what does it mean? Mean deviation, pattern standard deviation. Basically, what I'm trying to show on this is that the mean deviation is taking all the points into account, and if they're all reduced by one or half reduced by two or a quarter reduced by four, you're still going to get a mean deviation of one. So it just tells us how deep the defect is. I'm going to make it really, really simple, how deep the defect is. Pattern standard deviation just tells us how localized the defect is. So by looking at these numbers... I know that it's zero, one's not too far away from that. It's not a very deep defect. And that one is very low as opposed to an eight or a nine in the pattern standard deviation, which tells us it's very localized, a few spots causing it. So how deep, how localized it is. So we have the visual field index. These are part of those visual field indices, mean deviation, how deep, pattern standard deviation, how localized. The visual field index is more of an enhanced, when you see this visual field index is 97%, it's more of an enhanced mean deviation designed to be less affected by cataracts, more sensitive to changes in the center visual field. It better correlates, look right here, with the ganglion cells. So this here is more of this visual field index is again, more of that macular testing, 100% would be normal. And then if it was zero, it would be, you know, uh, parametric blindness. So again, when I'm doing visual field index and, and mean deviation, this is more staging, like, okay, it's a mild defect, it's a mild defect. And then I'm watching over time to see if it's going downhill. So that's your pattern deviation is how localized it is, mean deviation, how deep, and then your visual field index, anywhere from 100% down to zero, more of an enhanced, checking out the ganglion cells, less affected by cataracts. Now, with that being said, this I was teaching mean deviation one day, and I'm standing during a lecture, and I, you know, I just dawned on me. I didn't even know the answer. I asked a question. I'm like, you know, what's the mean deviation of a blind eye? You know, is it plus 100, plus 32? Is it zero? Is it minus 32? Is it minus 100 decibels? What is the mean deviation? How low does this thing go, right? I'm at zero. I just saw a minus one. I'm treating glaucoma. What's a blind eye? So I did the lecture. It was bothering me the whole flight home. I, you know, it was bothering me. I couldn't wait to get to work on Monday. And I went into Sarah and I said, hey, Sarah, do me a favor. Turn on the visual field, 35 years old, 24-2, see the standard, let it run as if the patient's blind. She like looked at me like, doc, are you okay? Like, you know, I need to go home. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm all excited about it. When it's done, print it out, type in age 65, 24-2, da, 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 let it run, print them out and give them to me. So I was really excited to get to work that day because I couldn't wait to put it into a lecture. I wanted to see the answer, and then I put it into a lecture. So we're going to share the results. We got one person saying 100, got another person saying 32. That would be plus. 
We got zero. That would be a normal. We got 25% there. 32, you guys are nailing it. And then minus 100 and not sure. There are the results. Let me just show you what happened that day. So here's that 35-year-old right here. Obviously, I didn't have the fovea on because we weren't thresholding it. I wanted to see what would happen. Look, all the numbers are zero. And you can see here minus 34. Now, look what happened here. Why does this go from here to here? Well, remember, the, the, the visual field is so depressed that it raises it up and makes it go back to normal. And right here, it shows you how localized it is. It's very diffuse, right? The whole visual field is involved. So minus 34 in someone 35 years old, here's someone 65 right here, minus 32. So I don't have this as a polling question, but if minus 32 is a blind eye, is minus 16 half blind, right? That's what I wanted to know. I'm starting off at zero. And I now know when I treat glaucoma, I don't want them to get the 32. That's a blind eye. Um, is 16 half blind? And the answer is no. Visual fields are not linear. So you can't say that 16 is half blind. That's out there. So I did the same thing with, uh, with the new visual field, the, uh, the Humphrey visual field three. You could still see here at 35 years old, it's about minus 33. I got the new visual field. I wanted to threshold it again, 32. So again, a blind eye, depending on age, about minus 32. Um, so that's why zero to five is considered a mild defect using the mean deviation. And five to 10 is a moderate defect and anything above a 10. And this was from an OGS discussion that we had ooh, probably about six or eight years ago. Um, where, you know, minus, you know, zero to five is a mild defect, five to 10 is a moderate defect, anything above a 10 is a severe visual field defect. And you can see here 32 is a blind eye. So 32 is about a third of that. And we're considering that a, 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 a severe visual field defect. Now, this has worked really, really well for me over the years. I like pointing this tip out. How do I set a target pressure in my practice? Looking at uh, OCTs, looking at nerve fiber, looking at pictures, looking at all this data that we can get, what I've really learned to do over the years, and it's pretty much st stood the test of time for about the last 15 to 20 years, is I really don't set my target IOP until I get a reliable visual field. Once I get a reliable visual field, then based on the other, the, the worst eye, because remember glaucoma is usually asymmetric, based on the worst eye. So if one is a minus two and the other one's a minus four, okay, they're both under five. I'm gonna go with a 30% reduction. But if one's a minus three and one's a minus six, I'm going for a 40% reduction. If I have someone coming in and they're already a minus 10 or above in one eye, 50% reduction. And I apply that to both eyes because the other eye is eventually most likely going to catch up. So this has really been a nice little, if you're looking for a good way to set a target IOP in your practice, get a reliable visual field, look at the mean deviation, the worst one, apply this zero to five, five to 10, above 10. And then as you follow the patient, you can adjust it uh, over time. Uh, how many decibel difference between the two visual fields? You can do this a couple of ways. You can test your APD skills. You can test your, um, you know, your, your visual field based on reliability. If you have a 10 in one eye and you have a five in the other eye, that's a five decibel difference. The 10 should have the APD, right? So it's about a three decibel difference. That's a little tough to see if you had a seven and a 10, the 10 eye should have the APD. You use a little uh, neurodensity filter, you can definitely bring it out. But you know, when it's about a four or five difference, you can definitely see the APD. So it's a good way to check your APD skills or to see if the visual fields are reliable that are out there. All right, let's start pulling a, you know, a lot of this uh, all together out there. Maybe look at some visual fields uh, that are here. So here's a 65 year old woman, IOPs, uh, T-Max were 24, PACs were kind of eh, you know, 585, not really doing much. 
So here's the right eye. You can see the strategy was a 24 2, so 24 degrees superior, inferior, uh, and temporal going nasal 30 degrees. Uh, we see minimal fixation losses, pretty reliable. There's your 35 on your mean deviation. This is a 65 year old patient. Look how nice and steady, great test. Within normal limits, 99%, so almost 100%, and minus 0 0.06. And that little bit of a defect is diffusely scattered throughout the visual field. But when we jump to the, or we look at the, uh, to the progression analysis here, you can see that we're doing pretty good over time with this patient. I'm not sure if I'm treating him or not. Maybe it'll be revealed on the next slide. But as a 65-year-old woman with 24s, maybe it's an ocular hypertensive patient. Here's the left eye. Again, 24-2 strategy, 35. So good, you know, 2020 on both eyes here. We have a few false positives, no false negatives. You can see the lens that was involved here, a plus nine on this patient. So they did very well uh, with not getting a rim defect, positioned well within normal limits, 99% and uh, minus 0 0.61. So a very mild defect, diffusely scattered. And I don't think I'm following this patient. I mean, I don't think I'm treating this patient. I'm definitely following the patient. I'm not treating the patient. And you can see, see the standard, see the standard, see the standard over a five-year period, no treatment needed using my visual field. Um, and obviously OCT and other testing, but based on the visual field, no disease, no functional loss. Here's a 54-year-old person, a woman with glaucoma. You could see in the right eye here what we're seeing. Again, that fovea on 35, again, should be about 2020 in this 54-year-old person. Few false positives. And here's that what Joe was saying. You know, some glaucoma docs would be like, oh, pff, can't use this. I think there's some data in here that could be used. So, you know, the false positives are a little bit high. We're going to take that. You can see it didn't really, uh, you expected worse here. It didn't really raise it or, you know, up so much that things are dropping out. So it got better as we went over here. So I think false positives here didn't really destroy this visual field. And now let's take a look. 93%. We have a minus three. There's that zero to five. But look right here. See how this number's creeping up? It's just a few of these points creating that minus 3.71 on that, that mild defect. And we can see how we're doing over time. And I love showing this here. You see how this visual field drifted up? I think that this is this patient with glaucoma. Obviously they might've got better at taking the visual field, but when you take the stress off of those retina ganglion cells, you also can get improvement, <laughs> right? The ganglion cell, remember I told you, doesn't die, doesn't go from living to dead, you get those ones that are slightly wounded, you take that pressure off by treating them, you can get an improvement of the visual field. Now, you're not going to get a visual field that's, you know, 40% go back to 100, but you could see this slight test. This, to me, I like seeing this as indication that my treatment is also working. But you can see here the, the mean deviation started off at 5.14. They got a little bit better at minus 4.14. And we're doing pretty good because now they're at 3.71. So probably a little bit of improvement by taking the stress off the ganglion cells and probably a better visual field test taker. But we can see how we can use those. And look how localized this defect is up here in this earlier one. All right, here we jump into the left eye. This is a known glaucoma patient. We can see that the right eye is definitely worse than the left eye. Let's just put both visual fields up here. Uh, again, we got a 36 on the foveal. We got a 24-2. So we're going 24, 24, 24 at 30. Um, false positives. Again, high. Some docs might throw it up. But as Joe pointed out, I think we can use this visual field. Maybe they are sensitive as a 54-year-old and above the uh, average. So as we go through within normal limits, we're at 99%. Look, how deep is this defect? Not much. We're not anywhere close to minus 32. Oh man, this, this mouse. 
We're sitting here at minus 0 0.19, just barely under zero. And it's saying, hey, guys, it's diffusely scattered throughout the visual field. That's not how glaucoma usually works. It usually keeps pounding that same arcuate area. And you can see what we have we're doing over time. Uh, minus 1.57. We're treating this eye so it doesn't catch up to the other eye. And you can see that it's slightly improved over time. Here's a 59-year-old. Yep, go ahead, Greg, if, if you don't mind, we, we talk about, and you're, 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 you're giving a lot of great information about the false positive. I just want to make sure everybody understands how the, the new devices do false positives. Uh, when, when the stimulus is presented to a patient, the machine knows there is a specified interval of a reasonable response rate. And this is based upon age match norms. Now, there is this interval that a normal patient is going to respond. And if a patient responds too early or too late, the interpretation or inference is the responding is something other than the stimulus, thus it's a false positive. So we talk about a lot. I just want people to understand how it's actually done. It was done differently years ago when a lot of people uh, we're using these devices early, but it's that expected age-related interval of normal response time that if it's exceeded on either end, it's considered a false positive. And Joe, that's why it's great having you as a partner and someone here because that is great clarification as we kept speaking about it the whole time. So thank you for filling that in. Here's a 59-year-old person with severe glaucoma. Why am I calling it severe? Well, not based on obviously this right eye, because this right eye is only minus four. How is that severe? It might look severe. And you look at this like, oh my gosh, look how bad this glaucoma is. Not really. It's only minus four. And I say only minus four, and we just beat to death how much bad minus five is. But you know, we're down to minus four. It's not close to 32. Look how localized. There's just a few spots here bringing this in. Maybe a rim defect here. Maybe it's glaucoma, but you can see how deep it is here on the grayscale. Here's how we're doing uh, in the other eye. Or this is how we're doing over time. I'm sorry. This is over a four and a half year uh, period. This is the uh, right eye. So again, I'm using the visual field index for progression. I was at 98, now I'm at 97. That's in a four and a half year period. I feel pretty good. I went from 4.63 down to five, one decibel. But look here, look how localized this is. Now I'm a little concerned. There's a plus three lens here. We got a zero. We're starting to get a few of these in here. Um, we got a couple false positives. You know, we jumped a full, almost a full diopter here. It's very localized. I think we got a little bit of a rim defect going on. And this patient is 38 decibels in a 50. So that is acceptable. They're probably 20, 20 and uh, at 59 years old. But here's the other eye. This is why it gets considered severe glaucoma. Look at this defect, minus 10. Over here, the other eye, if you want to go with minus four or minus five, this eye will have an APD. It does have an APD. You can see how localized a defect is and the visual field index is at 59. This here is one I'm gonna, I saw this patient, they came in. I remember they were 54 years old, had pressures that were high. They were 2013 before I really set the standard in the practice of doing fovea on. And then when they came back, you could see 37. Look, this macula is still able to see 20, 20, 37. And we went from minus, oh, that's minus what? 15, 15.26. And I'm doing pretty good in this one here because it's minus 14. And we have 59 and we went to 61. So in four and a half years, this was a 50% IOP reduction because of this minus 16. Um, now we're at minus almost 15, 14.96. Uh, you can see very localized. Look how high those pan pattern standard deviations are. Now, what I want to point out is we've been taught that in glaucoma, these pattern standard deviations keep getting deeper and deeper in glaucoma. That's what happens. I had, a, I had a person call me up the one time and say, hey, look, the pattern standard deviation is going down. My glaucoma treatment must be doing great. 
Remember what I showed you on that one visual field where I got excited at minus 32, how this was a minus one? What happens is when that superior field starts to come into play, like in this example here, it's all inferior. If that superior starts to get damaged, that inferior neuroretinal rim and get a superior defect, all of a sudden now it's becoming more diffuse. An advanced glaucoma patient, this number will start to come down. So don't put that into a false sense of acuity. I'm like, no, it's worsening. You're starting to get the other half of the visual field involved. Um, a more aggressive treatment, get them off to maybe some surgery, so on and so forth. So here's the patient's uh, right eye and that progression analysis. Here's the left eye. You can see here that, you know, we're kind of clicking along. You can see what it's going to do. It's predicting what's going to happen in four years. But look at this eye that was pretty sick. Look how it kind of drifted up a little bit or straight across our little uphill tick. Again, when you take that stress off, and I understand that the patient might be getting better at the visual field, but if you take that stress off, it's kind of a, to me, like a, whew, I got the right treatment on here and they impress, uh, improved a little bit because I took that stress off those retina ganglion cells. You know, the structure versus function debate. This is a 48 year old man, 38 and 36, strong family history. You have this eye here that's showing obvious glaucoma, that inferior temporal glaucoma prone zone kind of matching that ganglion cell. But your structure test here looks good. You can see all the disease over here. These are all green. And then I go over here and do the visual field. Here's the right eye, right eye. I have this defect showing up. 36 on the decibels, not, looks pretty good here, two and one, 48 years old, 97%, mild defect at 2.74, kind of diffusely scattered in this area right here, matching this. This looks pretty good, but when we look at the visual field over here, look what shows up. So that structure versus function, and this was repeatable, we're showing a defect here but it's not showing up. It's uh, pretty cool. All right. At 48 years old, I'll take my glaucoma serious. Here's T Max. And we're sitting at what, 940 here? I'll probably go through this pretty quick because I'm going to talk about some of the wearable uh, devices. So here's a patient, 51 years old. I'm going to stay compliant. You can see his right eye is not too bad. He's at 98%. We're at minus one, diffusely scattered. This is his right eye. Here is his left eye. He really didn't want to be treated. I couldn't force him. I was showing it until he started getting dim in his left eye, minus 11. Look how asymmetric this glaucoma is. It's not a secondary glaucoma. Minus one here, minus 11 here. We got a 64. When he started getting dim here, he's like, oh, I'm starting to lose vision. At 51, I'm going to take my glaucoma serious. You could see over the years, buddy, you're losing vision. You're going blind. Uh, I don't want treated. Okay, minus six, minus seven. He hits minus 11. He starts noticing it. Now, look, we treated him and look how he drifted up. So pretty cool. That makes me feel like my, okay, those ganglion cells that were wounded on their way to dying recovered. And we kind of got this little uphill tick here. So it kind of makes me feel good that we got the right treatment going on for him. 69-year-old man with primary open angle glaucoma. Be careful, uh, right eye, visual field looks reliable with the fixation losses, false positives and negatives. This was one of my partners saying, hey, take a look at this visual field for me. Look at this, it's, it's a big change. And what should I do? Should I add more medicine? Uh, here's zero, zero, the false, the fovea was off. We've got a 69-year-old person here. We got a plus almost five lens, 4.75. That's a big lens. And if you interpret these numbers, look at the zeros that are going around here, even in a 24-2. And so, you know, we have this outside normal limits. They're at 79%, this kind of moderate defect. I said, let's repeat it. Let's get this lens, maybe even put a contact lens on the eye, that plus 4.75 as a contact lens. And even though this all looked good, I didn't like, again, when you interpret a visual field, I hate when people say, you just look at the pattern standard deviation. I have one in my phone the other day. Someone said, hey, interpret this visual field. They sent me the pattern. I'm like, send me the whole thing so I can interpret 
what we're looking at here, phobia on, the strategy, false positives, false negatives. Look at the gaze monitor. It's flat because the infrared couldn't, wasn't even hitting the eye. And that told me then that the lens was not in position. They're not even picking up any eye movement here. See the eye movement that's showing up here? This is just a bad visual field. Let's repeat it. And you can see now we got a more reliable visual field. So it's got to be careful sometimes. You got to interpret. Why isn't this moving? Because the infrared is hitting the trial lens. It's not even hitting the eye and picking up any movement. So even though this looks good, it's actually a bad visual field. All right, 69, this is the same one that he looked bad here. And then you can see it wasn't as bad in the other eye. This was showing up. It was just that right eye that was being caught. All right, in the next about eight minutes here, let me talk about wearables. So let me do this polling question. Do you have wearable technology in your office? Just curious. This is my son here. Again, I was writing an article for a magazine on kind of portable, small technology, just wasn't visual fields and uh, just questionable. It could be a uh, dark adaptation. Do you have Maculogix? That's one. Do you have a visual field in your office? Um, I have no proprietary interest in Hero. I do, whenever I speak for them, I, they do pay me on honorarium. They're not influencing me tonight talking about this. And there's other wearable visual field technologies out there. All right, I'm gonna end the poll, share the results and kind of, you know, wearables are catching on, right? We're slowly seeing this happen. We said 7% of the audience here is has wearables. So wearable visual field, uh, it's out there again, here's in my office, I have both of these. Here's my Humphrey, here's my, uh, my uh, Hero. Hero does a little bit more, does color vision, contrast sensitivity dark adaptation coming soon. Um, it's a wearable technology born out of Miami, uh, Baskin Palmer. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. It's just, just uh, in depth here because there's other wearables that are out there. And, you know, wearables are just not coming out of nowhere. All of them, and, and particularly this one, 10 years of clinical data, 40 US and inter, in, international patents, 1,000 patients in the clinical trials and 450 million patients with visual field defects that's out there. How does it correlate with the Humphrey visual field and the, and the HERU mean deviations, mean deviations in decibels? You can see here when it's zero, it's very tight, right? So everyone wants to kind of see how they plot out. I kind of do the same thing in my practice. This is kind of what Joe is pointing out here. That's why I keep this one in here. See, I tested the decibels. And you can see that the patient uh, was never probably regained their fixation. You see how this is perfectly below? This mm -hmm. probably should be pushed up. They probably never raised their, their eye up. So, you know, they, even with a good test taker at 66 here, but I wanted to see what would happen. So I torture my patients all the time to do lectures like this. I said, hey, I got this new device. Oh, this mouse is driving me crazy. Um, this right here, I got a new device. Will you try it? So here's the Humphrey. See the standard? This is the HERU 24-2 threshold pattern. And this is actually a little bit more representative of the true glaucoma. And the cool thing about the, the, these wearable devices, and here's another one, same person, here's their left eye, here's their right eye, or here's the, the HERU device, Humphrey versus HERU. So you can kind of see same, like again, like the concepts that I taught tonight, here's your threshold at 27, you know, here's your test duration, fixation losses. Here's the pattern. Uh, it's being done. Um, you can see mean deviation, pattern deviation. So a very mild defect. You look at this, you're like, wow, look how bad that defect is or this defect. Well, it's only minus 0 0.72. And it's kind of uh, uh, localized to a few little areas. So again, here is another one. This patient with glaucoma, this is... 94 on the visual field ind index. Here we go with a minus 283. Here's a minus 3.8, you know, minus 3.38. This defect versus defect. So really cool, these technologies that are out there. Uh, and I want to play a couple of the videos. So here's, you know, another uh, printout. This is, you know, through the HERU device. They're starting to color code it with, uh, instead of just being black, we're putting some yellows and uh, pinks and reds on here to show where the bad defects are. This one here is this one here with this kind of 
printout strategy. Now I want to play uh, a video here. This is a torture my patient. So I'll just play this video. So All you can right, listen. I'm here with uh, Robert. We just did Hebrew, but before this, I tortured them with the traditional Humphrey visual field. Robert, you were giving me uh, some uh, insights of, you know, what you liked about the Hebrew. You said it was different, but I'm not going to put any words in your mouth. Why don't you just tell me what you told me? Uh, the ease of operation, the, uh, I'll say the, the, the amount of stress to do it is less. Um, plus, you're also looking uh, around rather straight ahead. The, the optics that you're looking at are in your field of view left right up down um it, it makes it a little more comfortable uh it was a much easier maybe even a little shorter to do as far as uh, the time involved um the only thing i found with it that i thought was uh, a little distracting was i can see light into the uh i don't know what you call it the the, the uh hood that you have on the headset i can see light on the left and the right side um, makes it a little distracting but other than that it was uh, a much more pleasant experience. yes yeah, so if you had to pick between the two which one would you pick i'd, I'd take the, the even though that was one, a little yeah. distracting you would take that one right yes absolutely even even with the distraction it was a lot more pleasant so i'm going to pause that one there i'm going to play this gentleman here just a little bit of it Hey Mark, how are you? Uh, we just did the uh, Humphrey visual field. And since I have the technology of the Hero headset device, um, I tortured you and had you do both. Um, just tell me your thoughts on the, the headset, the Hero device. We were chatting about it. I just wanted to capture a little bit of this on video. Uh, well, the headset fits very nicely. Uh, it's nothing bulky. Um, the only thing is I would say that as long as you have a darker room, the field is a lot better. Um, following the balls as they change, listening to the commands, very easy to understand. Everything seemed to be very smooth. I didn't have any complications with it. Uh, to me, it seemed like there was a lot better than the old machine being, the old machine being bright, kind of hard. The dots weren't that clear. This one, you can see them a little bit better as you hit your clicker to change when you capture the balls as they do. So you like that dark background? The dark background's a yeah. lot better. The only thing you didn't like was you mentioned the way the headset is right now is you're getting a little glare from some of the extra lights. Yes. So I'm going to point out that when you do, it's a dark background. Someone asked trial lenses. The answer is yes, but set for distance, not for near. So you just put in their distance prescription. Someone asked, do they have a 24-2C technology? Not yet. They don't, they don't have progression analysis yet either, but it's coming. Um, so again, it's, it's limited, but you know, it's exciting. When I told you at the beginning, there's exciting technology. Now, remember the, I think they all say that it's shorter. They're always about the same test time, but it's more interactive there in order to get the superior visual field, the patient looks down and to get the inferior visual field, they have to look up. So while they're doing the test and the test is talking to them, they'll say, okay, now look up. It checks to make sure they have good fixation. And it's more interactive. The patient is moving. So they always seem to like it. It's, uh, so that's why I said, pay attention to the wearable technology. It's exciting out there. Uh, explore them all, figure out which ones are right for you, but it's really, really cool uh, that's out there. And they complain in a sense about this background light because it has to be done on with the lights on in the room, at least at a dim level. And it has to let a little bit of light in there. And that's what they pick up on. So it's my lights in my office that I just kind of have to pick a different area to do it. And I think they would be happy, but really cool technology. So they also have color vision in it. Uh, in this one, it's not limited, just the visual field. Um, someone asked about cost. It's a direct message to me. I'm really not sure. I'm um, not even sure what I we even paid into practice for it, but you know, that's why that there's reps out there reach out to the different reps. I wish I knew that for you that that asked that question. Color vision is in it. That makes it nice. There's contrast sensitivity. I do some macular testing and I do some nutraceuticals in my practice, as Joe mentioned, and it's nice to raise the the new their macular pigment in a sense, but I use a hand scanner and then I use contrast sensitivity and we see their glare disappear. And dark adaptation is coming soon, so pay attention to that. So, you know, what did we learn? We're getting close here. We're at 51. So I'm just going to skip through these here. Um, there was just a few just kind of showing you here. 24-2C, 
Here's a 24 dash two C. This was a patient of mine. Um, again, where I was doing, you know, the 24 dash two and the 24 dash two C where we're picking up these central defects in the macula. Um, and then just following it over time, showing how we can mix and match. So these are just a few visual fields. So this is the last slide. So I'm going to stop sharing this. I have one more polling question here. And the last polling question is, did this lecture help bring a little bit more love and understanding back to your visual field? Yes, no. And uh, this gives me what I wanted to see if there was any other questions here. Um, where can we get the, the photo that we answered that? Uh, looks like we got everything. So. All right, so with that being said, I'm gonna end that poll. I see a lot of people replying. Thanks everyone, it looks like it helped a lot. So I'll stop sharing that. And that will end, I don't see any other questions. I see some thank yous coming in. So thanks for attending and uh, uh, this course, this interactive distance learning course, bringing love back to the visual field. Um, it was truly a pleasure giving this. Joe, any final comments or thoughts on visual fields? Uh, I think it, it was a, a, an excellent review, an excellent uh, uh, application of some new things in here, things that we may not think about. You know, interesting, you know, we also do another visual field lecture where we get more into interp interpretation and what everything actually means, where I lead it as opposed to, and Greg, and Greg supports me. If you think that'd be interesting, let us know. We can put that one back on again sometime where we can actually look at what all the parameters mean, how they got there, and how to actually truly interpret. So put it in, in the... Uh, in the survey at the end or here in the chat, uh, whatever you like, and we can maybe think about doing that. You know, very, very kind of separate lecture. I thought it was really a great, uh, a, a great talk on visual fields, Greg. Yeah, I, clearly this is your Sergeant Peppers. <laughs> I appreciate it. And uh, thanks everyone. I see the comments coming in. That will end the CE uh, for tonight.